Welcome everybody to our university. This is our third time, University of Michigan uh, Alt Talk, and uh, it's really um, three years in the making of really developing uh, the University of Michigan Judith Tam Initiative. And I want to thank Judith Tam for her wonderful donation of starting this. And uh, I also want to introduce myself. My name is Mark Rosenzweig. I'm from West Bloomfield, Michigan. This is my 11th year with Alp Positive. And tomorrow I, I start my fifth TKI, which will be the NVL 655 trial, the new valent trial. And uh, I just want to let everyone know to give some hope. I spent three months on electinib, blew through that drug, and seven years on Norlatinib. So go figure. There's no rhyme or reason to that. So I just want to let everyone know that. And uh, um, I'm going to go ahead and start some polling questions. And as usual, um, I'm going to have Summer do the uh, actual uh, reading of them because I was told that my voice isn't good. So <laughs> here we go. And then also, Summer, you can unmute and tell people how to do ca uh, closed caption. Oh, yes. Mark, I've been telling you that about your voice for years. I don't know how oh. I'm surprised. Just kidding. We love that uh, that little raspiness. Anyway, yes, everybody, um, please, if you would like to see captions on your screen to understand us a little bit better or to translate, it's still a work in progress, but there is three dots and a more button um, on your toolbar. And from there, you can um, select captions. So again, we take any feedback, keep us posted, let us know what's working and what's not working. And by the way, my name is Summer Farman, uh, ALK positive um, patient thriver since uh, June of 2020 and happy to be here with you tonight as Mark's sidekick. So here we go. Okay. Um, polling question. What is the type of treatment you are receiving? Go ahead. We'll give you another few seconds for those of you just coming in. It's so nice for everybody to be able to see where we all are. I would be picking Brigatinib, but I don't have that choice here um, for myself. So here we go. I am going to end the poll. Oh, there you go. Mark, go ahead. He shared the results. Okay, so we have 57% are on electinib, 27% are lorlatinib, 7%, uh, including myself, on brigatinib, chemo and a TKI, 4%, um, chemo, 1%, and then Mark, sure, tomorrow would be clinical trial, but he's not on there um, right now. There you go. Next question. How many different lines of treatment have you been on? Again, I can't answer. For me, it would be two. I was on one briefly and had to switch due to liver toxicity, just in case anybody out there cares to know. Um, so I am on my second line. And this will be my seventh line <laughs> so go figure right exactly seventh how talk about hope that's amazing so go ahead and finish up there everybody get those answers in mark i think we are good are we good yep we just yeah. had one more all right okay let's see um first line 56 percent second line 24 third 10 percent um, fourth line of treatment, 7%. Fifth line of treatment, 1%. Six or more, 1%. Awesome. Okay, Mark, go ahead. And final question. When were you diagnosed? How long ago? And they're coming in. I think we need to start doing the Jeopardy theme song. What do you think? I know. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Maybe I can have Yvonne add that to our edit. For for you sure. That would be very cool. I love that. Or that might be a good um, spot for my tap routine that I want to. And the other thing, too, is uh, put your questions in the chat. And then uh, we can read them to our presenters. 
perfect. Again, I can't answer this, but for me, the answer would be three and a half years. Um, so let's see, when were you diagnosed? Um, here we go, 22% of you, one to two years. Um, after that, three to four years, that's interesting. Um, that's awesome, but a lot of times it then falls to under one. So one to two years, 22% of you, three to four years since diagnosis, 18%. Under a year, 17% of you. Um, two to three years since diagnosis, 15% of you. Uh, four to five years, 11% of you. Six to seven years, 9% of you. Eight years or longer, which Mark would also fall into this one, 8%. Again, so much hope. Thank you for answering that. I'm going to pass the microphone over to Ken. Ken, can you explain to everyone first of all your title and what you do, and then we can start the out talk. Yes, my pleasure. Can you hear me okay, Mark? Awesome. Yes. Okay, because you were frozen. I know if it was me. So, well, hi, Elk Community. Uh, Ken Culver, um, employed by Elk Positive as the Director of Research and Clinical Affairs. I have the privilege of working with our medical teams to try to identify new research opportunities that are going to bring new treatments to outpatients now, as soon as possible. We've got a really skilled group of people on the medical committee. There's always room for more. If you're interested, contact me. One of the most important things we do as an organization is collaborate with experts in the field to enable a new research that's going to change and, and ALK positive therapy towards reaching our goal, which is a cure for the disease. And I wanted to just share my screen for a moment because everybody should know this if they don't already, is that tonight we're hearing from the Judith Tam um, Initiative, Lung Cancer Initiative at the University of Michigan. And they now have this cool new uh, website. I put the link to it in the chat. And I think so tonight our speakers are First will be Angel Chin, who many of you know from the summit and other, perhaps other, um, other venues. She is the clinical lead for this really uh, special and extraordinary uh, initiative at the University of Michigan. And then Sophia Mariver, who is the overall lead of the program, will be our second speaker tonight. And I think it's fair to say I wanted to just highlight um, three things. One is we're partnering. Uh, our, reg our lung cancer registry with the University of Michigan. So we can utilize the information that they are get gathering on patients and the information we are gathering through the registry. It's all confidential, of course, and, and they don't know patient identities to maximize the value of what you're doing by joining the registry. So please, if you haven't signed up, do. If you haven't kept up your form filling, we need your forms filled out as soon as possible. The next thing is um, we are in, uh, we are funding uh, the gilteritinib trial. We're working with longevity, but it's you, the patient community, who are funding this trial. Angel's going to tell us all about that. And there are other research initiatives that I'm sure we're going to hear about from Sophia that gives you the opportunity to participate and to help move research and out forward. And so I would like to encourage everybody to listen carefully throughout the whole hour because there's going to be a lot of really important stuff shared. Mark, um, with no further ado, um, Angel Chin, we're looking forward to hearing your uh, what you'd like to share with us tonight. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Ken, and good evening to all of you or wherever time you may be. Um, am I allowed to share my slides? Yes. Okay. Can everybody see my slides? Yep. Okay. So, um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Angel Chen. I'm a medical oncologist, University of Michigan. Uh, and as Ken mentioned, I am the clinical lead of the Judith Tam Research Initiative. Um, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the gilteritinib study, which um, I'm very excited because we're, we're very, very, very close to opening it. So um, just so that we're all on the same page, especially since I saw through the poll that some of you have only been diagnosed in the first or second year. Um, 
I just want to walk through why I am so excited about the guilt trip study. So as all of us know here at the ALK TKI, we're tying kinase inhibitors as standard of care for ALK non-small cell lung cancer. Um, a little bit of history, this fusion was actually um, discovered back in 2007 by a group in Japan, and it was shown to be a distinct oncogenic event, uh, meaning it was sought um seem to be an oncogene in non-small cell lung cancer. And in 2013, Dr. Atlas Shaw, whom many of us know as one of the pioneers of ALK, uh, showed in a clinical trial that crizotinib was better than chemotherapy in the second line and then the first line in 2014. So very quickly, uh, the TKI became our standard of care. But we know that resistance happens. Um, and so I think it's fair to say that our current treatment paradigm really consists of either a Luxinib first, which is a second generation ALK TKI, and upon progression, Lorlatinib, which is third generation ALK TKI, or uh, starting with Lorlatinib. Both, I think, are are very reasonable. Of course, there are many other ALK TKIs. Crizotinib, Sritinib, Brigatinib are the other ones that are approved. Um, and certainly it is not wrong to be on those, but I'm just listing what I think are the most common current treatment paradigms. And then for me, I want to emphasize that at progression, we should always try to biopsy if possible, whether that's the blood or the tissue, to understand why we are just seeing resistance develop. Um, and this is a wonderful paper that um, uh, Dr. Schneider from Massachusetts General published, talking about the different mechanisms of resistance. So why um, cancer no longer is sensitive to the ALK inhibitor. So on your left, you see something called on-target resistance. So we're looking at mutations that can develop. And this happens a little bit more commonly um, uh, if you've only been on the ALK TKIs. In the middle, you see uh, something called bypass pathway activation. Um, and this simply means that other pathways other than ALK are now becoming activated or turned on, if you will, so that blocking ALK is no longer uh, enough, if you will, to stop what is happening with the cancer cell. And on the far right, you'll see that sometimes cancer cells become resistant by becoming a totally different kind of cancer. So most often, ALK fusions are found in adenocarcinomas. And sometimes the way that the cancer becomes resistant is it transforms into squamous cell carcinoma or small cell carcinoma. And this is why it's so incredibly important, if possible, to get tissue if we're concerned about resistance. So what happens after lorlatinib? I think this is a burning question in all of our minds right now. And this is a wonderful paper done from Dr. Aaron Hada's group from Massachusetts General, where they looked at 48 patients who had post-lorlatinib biopsies, and they try to understand what is the mechanism of resistance. You'll see in this pie graph, about half the time, they really could no longer detect a ALK mutation. And then about 20% of the time, there's a single mutation they found in ALK, and 30% of the time they found a compound mutation, meaning there's just more than one ALK mutation. And I think depending on the mutation, um, there are different ways we can consider treating it. And I will say that this is by no means how um, the only way to treat it, but this is some of my thoughts about how to treat some of these um, resistance mechanisms. I just want to highlight the... Uh, little graph there that has red and green and yellow, that just shows that these compound mutations that are much more likely to develop after exposure to lorlatinib usually become pretty resistant to at least the current ALK inhibitors that we have. And so for me, uh, you know, I'm a clinician, so I, I think about things pretty simply. I think about what I would want to see in a post-lorlatinib TKI. So I think I would love to see a drug that has activity against a single ALK mutation. It also should have activity against compound ALK mutations. And I would also love it if it also had activity against ALK independent pathways. So essentially covering most of the resistance pathways that we've seen. And so this is where giltaritinib comes in. So giltaritinib is actually an FDA approved drug but it's approved for a very specific type of acute myeloid leukemia called a FLT3 leukemia. Um, and you're saying, well, why I don't have leukemia? Why would I want to take giltaritinib? And the reason is because giltaritinib not only has activity against FLT3, 
but also has activity against many of these other pathways, including ALK, and also pathways that are implicated in ALK independent resistance. Uh, Giltridib has activity against all of these. And so we'll see here, it's a paper that was done from another group in Japan where they looked at cells that had either uh, single mutations on the left or compound mutations on the middle and the right. And they showed that giltaritinib, which is in the stars, had significant activity against these mutations compared to electinib in the blue circle or lorilatinib in the square. So this is pretty exciting for us. And this is the basis for why we wish to um, open our study. So um, our study, and I just want to jump quickly to the actual protocol, um, the schema, if you will. So um, what we're trying to do is to, to essentially enroll patients who have ALK that have progressed in any number of treatments. We want to make it as inclusive as possible. Um, so these treatment cohorts are here only to help us for statistical analyses, but essentially if you've progressed in the first generation, a second generation, and or lorlatinib, so basically you're currently approved out TKIs, or if you just, you know, progress on electinib and lorlatinib, or you just progress on lorlatinib, you would belong to cohort one. You could have also gotten chemotherapy, which many people will, and that's cohort two. And then if you've been on any other number of trials, like the New Valence study or um, any other clinical trials or other um, treatments, you could still be enrolled on ours. So again, we really want to be the, um, as inclusive as possible. Um, this is technically considered a phase one study. And, and the reason because um, while this drug is approved by the FDA, it's approved for patients with leukemia. So we don't really have... Um, data as to how patients with ALK non-small cell lung cancer uh, will respond, if you will, or react to the drug. And because of this, uh, we have to do it in a phase one study, and we are enrolling only um, in small groups at a time. And because of this, we're actually uh, taking a dose de-escalation approach. So I think, you know, many of us associate phase one studies as you know, never tested in human beings, uh, drugs are never been tested in human beings, and gradually increasing the dose to find um, what we consider the maximally tolerated dose. This is a different situation because we know what the dose is in leukemia patients. And for safety purposes, we're actually starting at the FDA-approved dose of 120 milligrams, actually doing dose de-escalation, meaning taking down the dose if we're seeing... Um, significant toxicity occur. And one of those things is called a DLT, which is a dose limiting toxicity. So um, this is essentially what this graph represents. Um, and we'll be working very closely with the statistician to uh, appropriately dose our patients. Um, and with that, um, other big things is this study is going to be done um, only at the University of Michigan. It's a single site. Uh, we're very, very close to opening it. We had our SIV, which is our site initiation visit last Wednesday. We're waiting for the lawyers of both Estellas, who is the maker of the drug and who has, um, a, a, who is providing the drug to our patients on the study, and the lawyers, University of Michigan, to finally sign on the dotted line. Um, so we're hopeful that, you know, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be opening it. Um, and from with that, I will stop my sharing and I will be happy to take any questions. So Angel, um, I know there are probably questions in the chat, maybe some are in Mark, you can pull out the ones you like most. Can you, you, you have three cohorts so you can enroll all kinds of patients. So what does somebody do if they're, they think they might wanna do Kelteridinib? What's the process for them to find out um, more about the study? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, of course, as soon as we are officially open to enrollment, we will be alerting all of you um, through ALK Positive. Um, and then the way that this would work is, is kind of like um, if you're interested in any clinical trial, you would have to come to meet with us at University of Michigan. We'll have to gather all of your records, look at your scans, making sure that this is a good fit for, for you as a patient, right? 
Um, and then once you sign the consent form, you allow us to begin the screening process, which means making sure all the parameters are met um, and then get going. Great, thank you. And they can, they can get your contact information off the Judas Tam website or off clinicaltrials.gov, I assume. Correct. Okay. Summer and Mark, did you, there's a bunch of questions coming in. Uh, questions about location of the trial. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do have a question though. Uh, any idea how many slots will be in the trial? So we're looking to enroll 30 total patients. Okay. So about uh, anybody, and when does it start exactly? I'm sorry, I missed that. Whenever the lawyers sign on the data line. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. We'll be on the lookout for that. So can you say something about the toxicities of the drug in leukemia so people have an idea what they're looking at? Sorry, Summer. No, you're good. Yeah, so um, that's one of the reasons why this is also a phase one study because some of the toxicities um, may be more specific to leukemia patients, right? So leukemia is a cancer of the bone marrow. So a lot of these patients have very low blood count, can have very low blood counts. And so you can see that with this drug to exacerbate that. Whether or not that's a function of the a leukemia or the drug, unclear. Fatigue can be associated with it. LFTs or liver function tests can become abnormal as they can with any TKI. So that's another reason we want to keep a close eye on this. Um, some of the very rare, rare side effects, um, there's one called dedifferentiation syndrome, uh, but I think that's very leukemia specific. It means it makes leukemia into a, a, a different type of more aggressive cancer, but I don't think that is applicable in a non-leukemia patient. Um, when I've spoken to my hematology colleagues, as well as the pharmacists that prescribe these drugs, they say it's actually generally quite well tolerated. We do have some chat questions. Um, will this trial take any output patients with his, his, histological transformations? So that's a great question. We are um, currently the the um, histologies we include are adenocarcinoma, squamous cell, or adenosquamous. I, you know, I, I also treat small cell lung cancer. And unfortunately, I think when a cancer transforms into a small cell, we do have to still uh, treat it more like a small cell uh, just because of the nature of the disease. I don't think it would be safe um, or ethical to actually include that into the study. Do you have to be a U.S.? Um... Only U.S. patients, or can you be from Canada, or I mean, other locations? Um, so I think that gets tricky in clinical trials in general because on a clinical trial, um, many of the things are still billed to your insurance if they're considered standard of care. For example, like going to see a doctor or getting certain blood tests is still considered standard of care, so it's actually billed to a patient's insurance. The things that are considered extra for a trial, like taking the guilt to retinib, getting extra scans, that's paid for by the trial. So the idea is that for a patient, you don't have to pay extra to become part of the trial. But I think um, it's a little bit tricky for non-U.S. citizens because of the insurance issue and how to bill to a non-U.S. Um, insurance. From my understanding, that those are usually out of pocket. Um, another question, is there an advantage to this trial in terms of off-target mutations? Yes, yeah, so we think that's one of the reasons giltaritinib potentially could be a very good option is because um, it does have activity in multiple different pathways um, that can be activated in ALK, or in ALK as a non-ALK pathway. So we think it can hit ALK and then also non-ALK pathways. Was there any other um, mouse um, preclinical data? So there's been quite a few papers that have been published uh, with giltaritinib. The one that I use is just one of them. And then Dr. Mariver can comment on, she actually met the team of scientists in Japan who actually initially ran the studies. The, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Uh, another question came in. Does it penetrate through the blood-brain barrier so that's a really great question. So that is something we will be investigating in our study. And, and Dr. Mariver and her incredible, brilliant team of scientists are looking at different models to try to see this right now. Uh, the answer is we don't know. So there are case reports of 
um, when patients who had leukemia, where this drug is approved, had leukemia go into their CSF, that there was effect of the gilteritinib on that. Again, that's a case report because CNS disease and leukemia is actually quite rare. And so how to apply to the ALK community, we do not know, but we want to learn more about it. And, and this maybe you don't know the answer to, but um, during a phase one trial, you take 30 patients. Um, how does it work if you do see good results? When does that expand? Yeah, so I think our the reason we picked 30, well, I didn't pick it. Our statistician did uh, because he told me that was the number we needed to have a confidence interval where we saw a good response rate. It would truly imply that there's a signal. And my sincere hope is that if there is that signal that we can convince Estellas to allow us to open a bigger study and perhaps across multiple centers. And then the other question follow-up would be is, do you need progression disease and how large of a disease do you need? Do you know those answers yet? Do I need progression of disease? I mean, do you have to have a certain diameter of your progression size, oh. like one centimeter? Or... Yeah. So most clinical trials do request, like ours, that patients have measurable disease for mm -hmm. something called the resist criteria. It's official radiographic criteria as to how we measure a tumor. Um, essentially means greater than uh, 10 millimeters or one centimeter. Um, Ken or Summer, anything yeah, else? I'd like to I'd like to just add something in general. Angel, first of all, fantastic presentation. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really good for everybody to keep in mind that when when crizotinib was developed for ALK, it was actually known to be a med inhibitor, and they found ALK through their phase one clinical trial. As other companies developed seritinib, brigatinib, electinib, and olatinib, the goal was to make it more and more and more specific for ALK and ALK mutations. And so we know, for instance, seritinib also hits other targets, but at the drug levels achieved in the blood, they may not be important. Gilteritinib, on the other hand, is what we call a multi-kinase inhibitor. And at the drug levels that are achieved in patients, it actually inhibits lots of targets. And so the reason why ALK inhibitors were in the beginning trying to be more and more specific was to minimize the toxicity created by hitting lots of targets. But now as ALK patients live longer and more and more pathways are being activated, the, these multi-kinase inhibitors may actually become more and more important and valuable in patients with later stage ALK disease because they inhibit more than one target. And they, while they do carry increased toxicity, uh, for you know more for some patients than others. That's sort of how gilteritinib gets into the mix here. And so there may be other multi-kinase inhibitors out there who may also become relevant in these settings where ALK is not the only thing making the cancer cell grow. So that's just a sort of a perspective on, on how things have changed now as we're thinking about late stage ALK lung cancer. That is... That was a great point. Um, thank you so much, Ken, for summing that up. I also had a direct message here that I just wanted to bring up, and then I have a couple more. But um, how is this drug different than Nuvalent, um, also in a clinical trial? How would you know which one um, you should try? Is it considered, are they both uh, fourth generation? Um, so great question. So the Nuvalent drug is a fourth generation ALK TKI. So it's even more specific for, for ALK. So like the, this is a perfect question for, from Ken, uh, Ken's explanation. Um, and so we think it has great efficacy in patients who likely still have ALK as an important uh, mechanism of their cancer's uh, reason for spread. Um, Gilteritinib, um, like Ken mentioned, is not a specific ALK inhibitor. It certainly can inhibit ALK, but inhibits many other pathways that um, are ALK independent, but can be implicated in ALK resistance. And so, um, so I, I guess I, I don't think there's really a competition because technically you can be part of our study, even if you've been on the new valence study. So I don't think there's any reason not to do try to do both if needed. Um, I think if you have ALK resistance still detected post lorlatinib, new valent study is a very, very good one to try to go for. But if your post-progression biopsy is not able to capture ALK, um, 
then we would certainly welcome you to, to see if gilcheritinib study is a good one for you. Awesome. That is, I think, everybody's burning question, you know, how to know which way to go. So thank you so much. Yeah. And then the other one was, do we have any data? I know leukemia is so different, like you said earlier, That's but progression, so. progression free survival or overall survival with guilt written abuse. Yeah. So um, leukemia, the way they measure events is actually a lot different um, than they we do in, in solid tumors. So um, all that I can say is that what I think the one um, endpoint that is probably the most relevant to us is that in gilteritib versus chemotherapy in the leukemia study, uh, twice as many patients as the gilteritinib group, uh, group had a full or complete remission um, compared to uh, the chemotherapy group. Um, the other kind of endpoints, event-free survival, it, it isn't quite the same as progression-free survival because the endpoints are very different leukemia. And Mark and Summer, just one thing before we transition to Sophia. What Angel just said beautifully is that each patient needs a treatment plan. And so if you're on whatever stage you're on and whatever you need to have a, a discussion with your oncologist to say, okay, if I progress, what's our plan? And, you know, that should start ideally with a biopsy and wherever possible to guide you on the decision about nuvalent or the latinib or gilteritinib or chemo or whatever it might be. So I really, we re one of the things we want to do as a, as a elk positive organization is just make sure that you're having those discussions. And if you're not getting the answers that you want, then feel free to seek an opinion from someone else who has expertise in elk and all the treatment options. Because having a plan instead of a fire drill could be life-saving. And we want to really make sure that everybody is planning ahead and, you know, we all hope that won't be the case, but we need to be smart. Sorry, Summer, for jumping in. No, Ken, I love that point. And you always do such a great job of helping to bring it, you know, widespread to all of us. So I love that. Thank you so much. And that is so true. When you're laying in those scans, you should know, you know, there's so much scan anxiety, but if you have a somewhat plan of action, I think that's huge. I just had a dress rehearsal in November, which my husband says we could have done without that dress rehearsal, but I did. I had to put my plan into action um, and see what was, I was going to do next. And it took a lot of the stress away knowing um, that. So I think that is huge. So um, yes. And then the only other question I saw come in that I thought was one, a great one was, what does the course of treatment look like? Is it daily, weekly, monthly? How does that happen? Um, depending on your dose is one to three pills once a day. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was fabulous. Anything else, anybody, um, before we let Dr. Chen go, and I don't know if you want to stay, stick around with us. We'd love to have you, or I know yeah. you have a lot, you know, <laughs> I'll stick around <laughs> until my kids are yelling at me. <laughs> okay. Perfect. That's how my house works too. The dog. <laughs> okay. Awesome. All right, Ken, go ahead and transition us. Thank you. All right. Well, Without any further ado, Sophia, we want to hear all about the exciting stuff you're doing and how we can make it a reality for the patients. Thank you so much, Ken, and everyone on the call. And good evening to everyone. I hope you had a good day. Uh, I know many of you are affected with ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer, and I hope it didn't bother you today. And that's what we all hope as cancer survivors um, so it's an honor for me to talk to you and uh, to, to try to lead this initiative. I think they hardly need me, but uh, I try to show up all the time and uh, encourage them. Uh, they are brilliant people. But the way we, we thought about this initiative, it's really quite different from how most of us do research in academia, uh, which is from grant to grant to grant over, over sort of uh, cycles of three to five years. Here, we wanted to bring solutions to patients immediately and to build teams that would quickly test uh, hypotheses, fail quickly if need be, and then succeed. 
So we have three, we have actually six parts to our initiatives, three big projects and three developing projects. So the three main big projects I can update you today. The, the, the first project is a brand new idea in lung cancer. To our knowledge, there is no other center doing this academically. And that is to, to take um, all opportunistic uh, tissues uh, from patients who need uh, a clinically indicated uh, intervention, such a biopsy or a resection, uh, in order to really study the live cells of the tumor that are giving you symptoms right now and that they are uh, you know, affecting your quality and in, uh, in possibly the length of life, as we have seen, happens in this disease. So how do we get in front of that in, in postpone, delay, or abolish that progression? How can we understand those live cells? Now, I don't have to tell uh, this group, I'm sure, how important molecular understanding of cancer is. So we are all incredibly interested in supporting that. But the, to, to our view, the part that's missing is what is happening in the live cells. What kills them specifically? <laughs> We want to kill cancer in this initiative. And so how do we do it? And how can we, in the laboratory, taking the patient's biospecimens, mimic as closely as possible what could be going on in your body right now and expose that environment? It's not just your cancer cells. It's everything else that you have that comes with it. We don't eliminate any cells. The immune cells are there, the fibroblasts are there, supporting tissues there, cells that make blood vessels are there. And I'll show you in a minute that we can see them all. So, um, and then to do very deep analysis at the molecular level, at the single cell level, and to test the drugs in a incredibly rigorous, reproducible, robust way. So that instead of being a guessing game after the molecules are spelled out. The molecules don't tell you which drugs will kill your tumor. The molecules tell you what the molecules tell you. That's it. Everything else is things that we add to based on literature experience, other understandings. Your tumor was never tested for the drugs you're gonna take. So we wanna change that. We want to change that because there are many, many changes in your tumor and neither you nor your doctor know what's best to attack. You know, when you have compound mutations, sure, we wanna attack compound mutations. That's, that's for sure. And I'll show you uh, a drug that we have that we think will do that very well. And we obviously uh, have a lot of faith in the novalent compound. We don't have that compound in our lab, but we have an analog of it. And we think the world of it, we think it's incredibly active. And good luck, Mark, and everyone else who's lining up for that trial. We're rooting for you. It's a great drug, we hope. So, um, you know, but, but we need more drugs. We need more options for patients because of spectrum of side effects, but also because of everything else. Just because a patient has a um, compound mutation in ALK, that doesn't mean the rest of the signaling is gone to sleep and is not doing anything. The rest of the cell is reacting to it. And there may be companion drugs we need. We picked up MEK inhibitors as enormously interesting um, drugs to, to add to uh, TKIs with incredible synergy. And other people have known this. Now, MEK inhibitors are being used for to survival advantage in melanoma, and melanoma patients also get side effects, but it is tolerated in that setting significantly well. So we think we can work with that. So that's just those are just some examples. I have some slides. Unfortunately, this slide set uh, we can't just make public because it has a lot of unpublished data. But uh, we are delighted to show you some of it to you. Uh, and uh, you know, the number one thing we have is this 
incredible network of centers. And, uh, and we have all of you who are interested in participating in the research. So uh, if you are interested, just contact us. And uh, we have a mechanism, a very straightforward mechanism to, uh, to talk to you. Uh, to, with your permission, get, get your information and talk to your clinician. And Dr. Chin is in charge of the clinical group. It's very well organized. Uh, and uh, we'll, we strive to enroll people from all over. We have a mechanism to receive samples uh, from outside locations with good, good results in the laboratory, something we needed to show. We didn't know if that was going to work well. And so anyway, let me, um, if I may share the screen, let me just show you some slides. And, uh, and I now, think- Dr. Mariver, this will be on our YouTube channel. So I don't know if that's okay, or if you wanna show these and then we can totally edit this part out, but I just wanted to give you the heads up. Um, you can, you can, um, can you edit the screen and just show me yep. talking? Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I just no, can't. that's okay. Well, we can do that. <laughs> because if I, if I show you uh, the exciting stuff, anyway, these are the people, some of the people. So we, we set out to, um, to demonstrate if we can understand clinical resistance and predict response to novel therapies. I mean, how can we help you and your clinician and your providers choose the drugs. Um, so that's, uh, those, that was the intention. Um, so then um, why, why do we need that? Why don't we just do precision medicine uh, based on, uh, on sequencing, on NGS? Well, this is why. Under the best circumstances of controlled trials in all cancers, the benefit has been 25%. If you set the barrier of response as low as 16% response rate, which to me is unacceptable to set it, but that's how it was set as a benefit. So even under that circumstance, it's 25% benefit. Um, benefit meaning anything. The, the actual prolongation of survival and quality of life cannot be shown. So this is all cancers. Uh, there are data for lung cancer in particular, just published last year, um, showing uh, that this is very promising for lung cancer. And in fact, when one has more deeper, deeper understanding of the tumors, we get more benefit. So we want to tag on to this understanding. And, and in fact, um, I'm going to... I'm going to keep it like this instead of going to slideshow so I can jump through the slides and leave time for questions. So right now, this is what's happening. I'm going to now go to the slideshow. Um, you have unranked list of potential therapies. You know, serotinib, brigatinib, you know, the rest of the drugs after electinib and lorlatinib, for example, in a particular sequence, right? Um, if there is progression or transformation to small cell, then there are a lot of other drugs totally different, right? Which ones to pick? So that's what we aim to do, to really have a suggested rank of therapies because every day of your life is valuable to you. And you need to know that you had the best shot at responding. That's all we're trying to do, very simple, really but it is not so simple to execute. Uh, so we need live cells. So we need to be extremely judicious and precious about how the cells are collected. Is it difficult? No, it's not difficult. Uh, it's just a little tube with very specific media and the media is everything. This has been tried multiple times in multiple companies, many, many times in history and it never worked before, but it can work. It's just difficult to get it right and to be consistent and to prove reliability. But that's what we are determined to do. And that's what we worked towards for seven years in triple negative breast cancer, in bladder cancer, in brain metastasis from all cancers, and now in lung cancer for the last two years nonstop. So the tumor is dissociated and it's put in short-term culture, very short-term, five days. Because you need the answer soon. You need to make decisions. You and your doctor need to make decisions. So we are talking 
Um, don't know why this changed, but that's okay. So I wanted to get to this. Here we have an example of organoids where I can show you, here is the tumor is designated. Here is all these numbers. Here is the tumor. But here are all kinds of other cells that your tumor had, that the person, the participant's tumor had. So this is not just the tumor because these cells play a role in whether the drugs kill your tumor or not. Because we've done that experiment. We can take these guys out, the other people, you know, all these other cells, and the drugs change in sensitivity. So that was a big headache. We stopped everything for a year until we got it right. How do we gently dissociate the cells so we preserve all the components that we know were there through single cell analysis? And then through, how can we prove that we are really doing the right thing? I think this is an example that some of you have seen before. This is one of, uh, one of our participants where we had two different samples from two different parts of the body. And that's a question that I know you were interested in. How, how representative is our work? Well, how representative is the biopsy that said you had all positive lung cancer? It represents the tissue it comes from, right? However, very few times in, in anyone's career, you have the, 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 uh, the honor, honestly, the gift uh, of a participant having two different samples in two different parts of the body. So you can frankly do almost the ultimate test of reliability of your platform. And I don't think I have to sell this to you very much. Anybody can look at this and see that uh, this sample, first of all, is quite resistant. Even though you see these, these curves falling down, the concentrations of these drugs are not achievable in humans. They are too high. Uh, this drug here, this TPX, TPX is, is probably familiar to you and you know this drug is no longer in clinical trials, was the most active one in this particular case. But it's still important to point out, and this is why having the live cells is so important to understand resistance. This is the most active drug in this particular sample but 30% of the sample survives it. So what's happening with these cells? Because these cells are gonna make that patient very ill. They are gonna survive it. And so we need to find out what's going on there and what kills them. So that's the purpose. So here I'm showing you fewer spaghetti so that you see the picture. So this is an enormous, enormous advance for us. We were able Sophia? to do that. Yeah. Since Ken, could you go back one slide? I just, there was a question that came in the chat and I wanted to ask. So oh yeah, those, I'm sorry. I don't have the chat open. No, well, that's so, why I, that's why okay. I'm hoping. For sorry. those of you that aren't so familiar with this kind of a graph, the x-axis, the one labeled log M, that's the concentration of the drug. So the lowest concentration on the left and the highest concentration yeah. on the right. So tumors that are really sensitive, the curve will drop really fast, meaning it's yeah. killed at low concentration. So you look at blue, the electinib going straight across, no concentration really kills that this tumor of electinib. And you can see it with the green or latinib, it kills a little better, you know, about halfway across. The purple, the brigatinib goes further, but as as uh, Sophia said, the brown one, which in this case is TBX 131, it shows the quickest drop. And that it, and they merely mirror each other in both of these tumor locations. So just to answer the chat question, when you have a brand new out positive lung cancer, these curves look completely different. Right. They like would be looking, they would be looking like this curve only over here. Oh, shifted to the left, way over the, to the left. Right. So at very low concentrations, they'll kill almost everything, but not everything. If they killed everything, you would never progress. So that's the that's the key. We need to understand what they leave behind. We get happy that they kill, of course, but we got to kill everything. That's how we cure leukemia. That's how we cure testicular cancer. 
That's how we cure breast cancer. So that's how we will cure our positive lung cancer, by thinking of, ki of killing everything. Now, this is very quantitative. The only reason I'm showing you this is because it is incredibly rigorous work. I wouldn't have any interest in doing this, in wasting any of your time, in having any piece of your biopsy come to Michigan, if I did not see the incredible rigor of these numbers. You know, uh, this is two different samples of the same patient. And here is the sensitivity to different drugs. It is an incredible, incredible um, quantitative agreement. Um, so Can we just go back, yeah. Sophia, we go back one more, just this is so great. If those of you that were, so we'll go forward to the okay. next one, this one. If those of you that are, um, were at the summit, uh, Angel showed, if not this one, a very similar one. And there's just a couple of points. If you look down the left-hand column, you'll see giltaritinib. Yes. Giltaritinib um, high up. You'll see, I know Summer has already noticed, right? Ergatinib is right at the top. And yeah. so this is really informative is because it gives you, it gives you a clue as to drugs that already are known to have activity against ALK, what their relative sensitivity is at the tumor at this specific point in time. And you can right. see there's a variety of, many of these are chemotherapies. And this data on the left, you can see electinib almost to the bottom, red all the way across, fits exactly with the previous graph that Sophia has shown. So this yeah. is one of the advantages of getting this kind of testing done at Michigan. There are other places probably that do it. Michigan's really worked on perfecting theirs that can give, give you and your physician some additional information when decision-making gets challenging. Yeah, so exactly. You know, if people are guessing anywhere, uh, anyway, so is it a uh, novalent drug, brigatinib, uh, trimetinib, you know, which one, which one works better, um, then you have to trust uh, the quantitation. It's very important. Now, here is an example of somebody very resistant. This is a tiny, tiny biopsy, super tiny. Uh, we knew we would only be able to test about five, six drugs. So in combination with, in consultation with the patient and the physician, taking care of the patient or the or the group taking care of the patient and talking to Dr. Chin and the other members, uh, we don't decide, and no company will do that for you, right? Uh, we don't decide ourselves arbitrarily. We don't have like a, a, a list of drugs. What good would that do? I We need to know what you're interested in, in terms of what you've had before and what you're, you and your doctor have been discussing optimally so we can tailor it we will tailor it and in this case uh we did find something that leaves only 29 percent of the cells but the paralectinib leaves 92 percent of the cells completely resistant low latin pretty bad too so gilteritinib not great either but seritinib in this case so you know if somebody's again if somebody's guessing or there is no clinical trial or whatever, this is additional information. Um, sometimes it looks like this. Um, there is almost nothing, but sometimes there is something. Now, whether this drug is available or not, <laughs> we don't know. I mean, it was at the time we tested it. So uh, we have done uh, lots of validation with other oncogenes. So ALK is helping other oncogene uh, based lung cancers, um, you are you guys are raising the tide of all the ships because this platform works for all of them. So here is KRAS data. We have data on smoking uh, on no discernible oncogene, and we have data, of course, on gilteritinib. So and we met with Dr. Katayama, who was so emotional and so happy that Dr. Chin is opening the gilteritinib trial. And we did show him all the data we had on gilteritinib. And he was so excited. So it's just it's just really wonderful to have that option for patients. And I hope it works fantastic. Um, I know time is a little short, but I want to show you something that 
I don't think has ever been seen in the ALK field. But if I want to show it to somebody, I want to show you to I want to show it to you, the patients and the leadership of ALK positive. And that is um, these are single cell, uh, single cell analysis of tissues. And so I'm going to be showing you clusters of cells, these dots, believe it or not, represent individual cancer cells from biopsies in or for di from different tumors. And we have different types of ALK positive cells. So you can already probably surmise the importance of this, right? Because these different types may not all respond to the same drug, but if we understood what they could respond to, we could kill them all, right? And then there would be no other ones. There is nothing else if they are all here. So who are they and how do we know how they happen? This is kind of complicated, so I'm gonna skip it today, but this is two different clusters of cancer cells that we can actually find directly from certain kinds of calculations that we can do on how many genes are present, how many uh, uh, copies of the of the different genes, we call this copy, copy number variants. So this is very interesting, but I wanted to show you this. Now this is normal lung, um, but there is something the matter here. Really, really, really little, really, really little. So if you look, these are the ALK cells that I showed you before. And they are already in this little tumor. There are all these different kinds of ALK cells and all these different colors. You have to look really carefully. You see them here. These are the, the real bright red ones. And here you see all kinds of other normal lung cells in between, but then you see other cells like these here. These are macrophages, different types of macrophages. Some of them help the tumor grow. Some of them help your immune system fight the tumor. We all know ALK patients don't have enough of the second type. Now we want to see if that's true. Uh, we think it's true, but we are now able to see if it is true. Now this is one area. Now here is the other area, right? And you can tell in one second, this is normal lung and this is not normal lung because this has been replaced by a lot of these red cells because in this area of the lung, the ALK cancer has taken over and there are very few of those other cells. So now we can really map the whole history of what happened here. Um, but I wanna show you this because this is the animal model. The animals help us tremendously. We instilled in animals, in, in mice, the fusion. So we put it in through the trachea of the mouse and the cells took it up. And this happened. They made little cancers. Here is at four weeks. You can already see these lungs are not completely normal. And this is, you, are, you guys are the first ones in the world to see this here. I want to show you this. Um, here is... Here is now you've seen those single cells cluster, so it doesn't look so strange anymore. So I want to show you. Unfortunately, these numbers are overlaying what I want to show you. But here is everything is the control. Everything is normal. There's nothing going on here. And then there is this little bonnet of cells that starts coming out of these green cells. They start getting this little bonnet. Guess what that is? That's the ALK tumor. And we can trace it back to just 57 cells. So really, really, really early. There is no imaging that ever even detects thousands of cells. No imaging, no PET, no nothing. MRI, you name it. And certainly no cell-free tumor DNA in circulation. You need way more cells than that. But here is how it starts. This is the origin story. It's never been seen before. So here are 57 cells, and we are going to figure out 
how they change to this and to this and to this and to this. And in only 12 weeks, this poor mouse is in bad shape because of this bonnet. And this is the ALK lung cancer, and here it is. And we can track everything that's going on. So we are gonna track how to stop it because we have to. There are events that occur as the tumor progresses, even from a few cells to a few hundred to a few thousand. It's seldom the case in all of oncology that we have the opportunity to see this. Seldom, certainly in lung cancer, very difficult. The lung being so so inaccessible. But you, we Sophia. did it, yeah. I want to jump in here just to add a couple things from the chat, and then I think Summer's probably got a sum summary here. Thank you, first of all, it's awesome. But if you go back to the slide you were on with the bar graph, there we go. So for those of you that aren't familiar, one of the really cool things they're doing is they have a, a virus that they we, that infects lung cells. And inside that virus, they put in the actually ALK fusion protein. So when they inject that in the trachea of the mouse, the virus, you know, just like a, it's an adenovirus, just like you and I might get, you know, going out to the store, um, it delivers in that fusion. So the, one of the key things they're trying to do, as Sophia was saying, is to understand what, why do people get ALK positive lung cancer? What is it about that fusion and what things are happening and what cells? And they're asking a lot of other questions too. And these really cool graphs and things we, we know are, are really complicated, but it shows the sophistication that the scientists now have to look into individual cells to try to understand what is happening, how are they cooperating, how are they being stubborn, how are they developing resistance in ways we could never begin to understand before. And so we're really, this is exciting, really exciting stuff, Sophia. And we look forward to learning more about it as the research progresses. So Summer, I know you had a few closing comments you wanted to make. I do, but is there anything I don't want to, um, Dr. Mariver, it's your Sunday evening that you are sharing with us. So I don't, we don't want to take too much time away from you and we want to be respectful, but if there's anything else you had planned on. Um, well, I wanted to show just this. Now that you all have seen curves, I wanted to show you these curves and then stop there. So this is the dual, the compound mutation that we all fear, right? In out, highly resistant to lorlatinib. Um, and here is the drug that we invented that is has oral bioavailability, can be taken as a pill. And it lasts, uh, the half-life is seven hours. And um, it is uh, incredibly sensitive. It's incredibly active against the dual mutant. So I want to leave you there and tell you we are going to beat this thing. And uh, thank you for your time. And thank you for the generosity of participation. I really, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Sophia. Really appreciate it. That was amazing. Thank you so much. And Ken, thank you for your translation because we all definitely... <laughs> that is very helpful for all of us, but we can feel your passion, Sophia. So we're all like on the edge of our seats, so excited, but then we just need Ken to help us along with that a little bit. Um, and in the chat too, um, if you look, there is um, contact information for how to um, get in touch with uh, the Michigan trial. Um, so make sure you go and cut and paste that to another document. I'll also put that um, on YouTube or in our groups too, so you can do that. Um, uh, just quick, a couple questions that I had sent earlier. Um, let me just see here. If they come to you, do they have a chance to talk with a pulmonologist? Someone had asked about that. Well, if they, um, yeah, if they need a biopsy at an institution, uh, the in, the uh, biopsy is done by a pulmonary doctor, okay. pulmonologist, yeah. Great, great, great. And if, it's an interventional person, obviously, and they could somebody also who does this almost, all the time. Okay, perfect. Sorry to interrupt you. Yes, thank you. I'm like, ah. Um, also, um, too, they could see you as a second opinion, right? It doesn't just have to be participation in this if their oncologist is not providing them feedback, yeah. it can also be done 
um, yeah. that way as well. Okay. And we might also have some other questions to follow up on. Um, Mark, before I go ahead into our peek ahead um, in upcoming weeks, is there anything else you want to say? Um, just one further question. That is people sending blood in, um, blood samples. So that's like one of the things, uh, NGS samples. Uh, how, how, do, how do we go about doing that? Well, the um, the blood samples, uh, we are investigating the immune environment. Those are part of the developing projects. And we are, uh, we are trying very hard to analyze the circulating tumor cells. And we can analyze them. We, we haven't succeeded in doing yet this in expanding them. Mm. Uh, if we could expand them, uh, it would be a huge advantage. But uh, we haven't. We are trying still. So that's, that's what, what happens to the blood samples. Right. And I just want to uh, express that Michigan has their own lab that is working with L positive, which you run. So I just want that's correct, right? <laughs> well, we we work. Um, we are doing research. We are not a company. Uh, but we are trying to get what's called plea approved so that the results of our test will go in the chart. We are doing that. That's a process. It's uh, it's very difficult. It, it has many steps, uh, but uh, we are going through it. It's, um, it's, it's a work in progress, but it's progressing very well. We have to have all the equipment in duplicate, for example. So it's not just not just difficult, but expensive. Do you want to give a shout out to Judith? I think she's on, on one of these squares. I want to say hello. <laughs> Hi, I want to thank her very much too. So yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you for playing on a Sunday again for the third time. And uh, Summer, do you have some closing comments? Or Ken, do you have anything else to add? No, um, fantastic. Thank you to the whole Michigan team. Oh, our pleasure. I agree, um, Dr. Mariver. It's always so fabulous to see you and catch up. So thank you so much. Um, and two, if you do have questions, for sure reach out and email because they are so responsive. And when I was having a panic in my dress rehearsal, I did immediately reach out as well. So um, they are a fabulous resource. So definitely copy um, that contact information from the chat. Um, as looking ahead with our ALK Talks, next week we have a very important um, palliative care talk next Sunday at seven o'clock. Um, I don't, that is very different from hospice. So if you're not sure um, what palliative care is, be sure to tune in if you have your own um, experiences and wanna learn more, we would love to hear about that. But palliative care focuses on living, managing those side effects. Um, even if you, again, just have a baseline visit, kind of like you might with a second opinion doctor, um, and then follow up with them as you need to, to manage um, your side effects. So that's huge. Um, also, Summit, we are so excited. Our 2024 Summit sold out in like record record time. We're not so excited about that part, but it's huge and a good problem to have that so many people want to come. You'll see my summit merch from last year right here, everybody. So be sure that whether you are attending virtually or in person, that you join our summit 2024 um, Facebook page. That will give you information if you're a virtual attendee on um, getting merchandise or even if you want to have some extra swag. Um, to bring with you, but all tips will be in there. And if um, you're on the wait list, don't fret because people do cancel, change plan, plans change. Um, so be sure to get yourself on the wait list, even if it is sold out. So we're working diligently behind the scenes. Please know that we are so excited um, for this event. Um, and then also, so I told you next Sunday, we have the palliative care talk, but between now and then there are um, many classes um, and opportunities for you to connect. So check out our healing arts calendar that's on the website, that's in the newsletter, that's on our social media. So be sure to see that specifically. We have our ALK night, uh, nightcap. It's like a happy hour of sorts and we haven't done one in almost a year, but it's all sorts of fun. Here's my dog growling. 
Uh, yeah, so please join us. I want to thank everyone for coming and Dr. Mariver and Dr. Chin. I know she, she left and Judith Sam, thank you so much. And Laura Gu is here. Laura runs, um, she takes the first part of the information. And Ken, you do a wonderful job bringing it down to people like myself who don't have high intelligence when it comes to these graphs. So, but everyone on mute and say thank you to everyone and Dr. Mariver and Judith Sam. Thank you so much.